to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the pride of your heart has deceived you obadiah verse 3. Welcome to our study of the Minor Prophets and today as we think about the book of Obadiah. As we've been studying the Minor Prophets, one of the key themes that we have found is God is encouraging His people, giving them time, giving them opportunity to repent and to be restored and to have that right relationship with Him. And such is the case in the book of Obadiah as well. Again, we want to encourage you, as always, that these lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. And we'd love for you to stop by. They'd love for you to stop by and visit with them. Visit the Church of Christ in your area. You'll find people who love the Bible and who love souls as well. And we encourage you to stop by and visit them. Today's lesson, of course, is being brought to you by the Central Church of Christ, overseen by the elders of the Central Church of Christ in McMinnville, Tennessee. And we'd love for you to stop by and visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We've got Bible study material, videos and audios on almost all books of the Bible, as well as study questions and things of that nature also. Maybe you've got a Bible question or maybe you'd like to study further. Friend, we want to encourage you to email us or contact us at the end of this lesson. And again, our website, thegospelofchrist.com, would be a great tool to help you in your Bible study. What is the book of Obadiah all about? Like 2nd and 3rd John, Obadiah is the shortest book in the Old Testament like they are in the New Testament. It's one of the least known books probably in the Bible. Who is Obadiah? He's a prophet of God. What is this book all about? Well, it's a very interesting setting in the book of Obadiah. In fact, it takes us back to the times of Genesis, especially Genesis chapter 25. Do you remember those two brothers who struggled when they came out, Jacob and Esau, and who were in a struggle most of their life until Jacob got his birthright from Esau? Esau, the firstborn, was deserving of it, but because he was hungry, and his brother was a great hunter, uh, or, and his brother was a great man, uh, he'd great made some soup. The Bible says that Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, and he regretted it ever since. Now friend, the Edomites, the people in the book of Obadiah, they're Israel's kin. They're Israel's kinfolks and thus they are the, the, the descendants of Esau. The Idumeans later and the Edomites at this period are descendants of Esau and they despise the Israelites because they received God's blessing. The, the promises came through them, and thus there's that struggle still. The Edomites, descendants of Esau, are just as fickle and shallow as their patriarch Esau, who sold his own birthright, even for a bowl of soup. Now, let me give you just a little more history about the Edomites to kind of help understand what's going on here, what's the background, and, and how this book really makes sense in the context. The Edomites felt cheated by Jacob and they held a continual grudge against Israel since the time of their birthright. They felt like they were the rightful owners of that birthright. Jacob swooped in, took it away from Esau, and thus they, they held this grudge. They felt like Edom should have been where Israel was if it weren't for that sly individual Jacob. We would be the honored one. They refused. In fact, here are some of the ways they show this hatred. Uh, during the time of Israel, they even refused to let Israel pass through their land during the wilderness wanderings. In Numbers chapter 20, verses 18 through 21, when Israel is, because of sin, wandering in the wilderness, Edomites, their own kinfolk, 
wouldn't even let them pass through. They uh, eventually tried to even invade Judah, but they failed, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse number 22. In fact, they went as far as to join the Babylonians, their enemies eventually, in the siege and captor of Ju capti captivation of Judah, and even cheered their enemies on. Psalm 137, verse number 7, they said, raise it, tear it down in essence. Amos 1 verse 11, here they are in the background and they're just enjoying Babylon take over Israel. They rejoiced over the downfall of Jerusalem. Here are people who ought to be close, who ought to be kinfolk, who ought to be sticking up for each other. And in essence, they're standing in the background laughing and enjoying their own brethren's destruction. And so there's a sad case of jealousy and dispute among these two people. Now as we think about some of the, the keys, some of the main ideas that will help us to understand the book of Obadiah, the key word is calamity. Obadiah is God's message of warning and ultimately calamity to Edom. Yeah, Edom's been back there cheering on the Babylonians. They've been back there rejoicing over Israel's destruction and God says, your time's coming too. If you're going to stand back and rejoice when people who are in sin receive the consequences of that and you're no better off than they are, calamity will also fall upon you. Key verse, Obadiah, verse number 10. Notice these words in Obadiah, verse number 10. The Bible says, For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever because of what they did to Jacob and because of their hatred and because of their shame and jealousy, God says no more. You're going to suffer the consequences. And so it's a stern warning to the Edomites. The key phrase occurs in verses 12 through 14. You should not have. God says you should not have laughed at it. You should not have cheered. You should not have said we can hide in the cleft of the rocks where nobody can find us. God said I'm coming up there and I'm going to get you down and there's going to be great trouble to come. The key message is this, Edom is going to be destroyed because they rejoiced at the calamity of their own brethren. You know, this is really a message of man's inhumanity to man. How should the Edomites have treated their own brethren? Hey, the people living in Israel at this time they're not responsible for what happened between Jacob and Esau. They can't control that. That's years later. How should they have treated their own brethren as brethren? They should have been kind. They should have been loving. They should have tried to restore what had been broken down. But instead, they're holding that grudge. They're jealous and they're just waiting for Israel's destruction. Friend, here's the practical application, really, the key application. We should never, ever rejoice at anybody else's calamity or destruction. No matter how big the grudge, no matter how much evil they may be doing, no matter how bad it may be, it ought not to make us happy, even when our enemies face calamity and destruction. Why? Because in calamity and destruction, there are always souls who are going to perish. There are always people always people, whether it be children, whether it be whatever it may be, who are going to suffer in the midst of that. And so how we need to have tenderness and love and care and compassion, even for our enemies, as Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those who, who hate you and, and use you and, and curse you. Bless and do not curse, Jesus would say. When we think about this lesson, there are several living messages that do occur in the book of Obadiah, and let's get to the heart and core of what was the problem with the Edomites. Pride was the main problem. Look at Obadiah, verse number 3. The Scripture says in verse 3, The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? God says, verse 4, Though you ascend as high as the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord God. The Edomites, in the, in the background of where they lived, in their geography, 
they lived in areas that were very rocky, mountainous areas, areas that most people couldn't get up to, most people wouldn't climb up to. They built their safety in the clefts of the rock. They said, we're up here, nobody's going to come up here and get us. We've got these holes we can hide in, we've got these caves, we've made our houses as nests for eagles, and nobody's coming to get us down. God says, though you think you're up there with the eagles, and though you think you've made your home in the stars in heaven, God says, I'm coming to bring you down. Friend, here's the lesson. Let's never say to ourselves, I can take care of myself. Let's never say, because of these factors, I'm okay, I'm safe, everything's going to work out. Let's not say, we've built our nation, we've built our home, we've got these forces. Or, No, God says, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Instead of trusting in external circumstances or external forces or, or money or, or things of that nature, we need to realize man must trust in the Lord with all his heart. Lean not on his own understanding. You know, this verse, Obadiah verse 3, I think really vividly illustrates the wise sage Solomon's words in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. If there ever an illustration of that, it's right here in the book of Obadiah. The Edomites thought they were too high up. They thought they were too well protected. Little did they know their time was coming. What's the major lesson? Friend, there's a practical lesson and it's this. No matter what, man cannot hide from God. You can go high, you can go low, you can go deep, whatever it may be. You can go dark, you'll never hide from God. Yeah, they made their, their houses really high in the mountains. Yeah, they were pretty much at the top of the elevation. But God said, don't think I won't come up there and get you. Hebrews 4 verse 13 says this, Of God, no creature is hidden from His sight, for all things are open and naked, before the eyes of Him with whom we must give an account. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord, the eye of the Lord's in every place, beholding the good and the evil. God's everywhere. Whether it be in the gates of Sheol, whether it be in the heights of heaven, whether it be in the dark crevices, Psalm 139 clearly teaches there's no place man can hide from God. You know, a famous couple in the Bible tried that not long after the first few pages of the Bible. Do you remember them? Adam and Eve. They'd just eaten of the forbidden fruit. And they made themselves clothing, and that clothing still wouldn't help them to feel like they ought to feel. Something was wrong, and they knew it because of sin. And, and they heard the voice of God in the cool of the day. And do you remember what they did? They hid themselves. They tried to hide from God. Didn't work then, won't work now. You cannot hide the sin problem from God and you cannot escape His punishment by going high or low. God is able to deal out to man the consequences He deserves if He continues in sin. And so let's not be prideful and say, hey, I can get out of this. Nobody will ever get out of it in God's sight. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Christ to the glory of God the Father. Uh, let's realize this as we think about relating the book of Obadiah to our day and age. You know, like the people in that time, the Edomites, we can become prideful in our location if we're not careful. Let me illustrate it this way. United States of America is one of the greatest countries in the world to live in. Freedom, we have great benefits, we have a, a powerful military. We're one of the blessed, most blessed nations in all the world. My friend, where's God in our nation today? It used to be the case that we were one nation under God. Now we're sometimes one nation in spite of God. Are we still in that place of safety? Not if God's not there. We say, well, what about all the military power? What about our Navy? What about all the forces we've got? What about all this that we've built around us, none of that will matter if God's not there. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says this, To Israel God said, Take heed 
lest you fall. Let's realize that we can't put our pride in our wealth. Oh, this was tried before. Look at Obadiah verse number 6. They tried it then. Obadiah verse 6, the people were saying, Oh, how Esau shall be searched out, how his hidden treasures shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. The hidden treasures... These people had indeed certain treasures. Two roads ran between the cliffs and their region. Oftentimes they would catch people coming through. Sometimes they would be able to take advantage of them. And they did have a lot of treasure because of that. What about the King's Highway? What about the toll road? What about all the money they'd gained up there? No. Won't help in the day of destruction. 1 Timothy 6 verse 9 following says that the love of money is a root of all kind of evil from which some have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Instead of trusting in our wealth, let's not say America is one of the richest countries in the world. We're not anymore. And friend, let's not put our trust in our money. Let's not put our trust in our allies and our friends. That's what Edom was doing. Verse number 7, they had friends around them who they thought would protect them, and yet in the end, those friends didn't help. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, Evil companions corrupt good morals. And let's surely not trust in our own wisdom. Let's trust in the wisdom that comes from on high. Now, I want you to notice another area that Edom was very prideful in. They were prideful in their own strength instead of God's. Look in Obadiah verse 9. The scripture says in verse number 9, then your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may cut, be cut off by slaughter. They thought they had strong men. They thought they had great warriors. They thought the, the mighty men of Teman were going to be the answer. Wasn't that way? They couldn't help them in the day of destruction. Psalm 46, 1 says, Our help is from God. God is a help in time of trouble. Psalm 27, 1, He is our refuge and our strength. And so let's not say we can put our pride in our strength. Won't hold up if God's not there. And friend, for sure, let's not be passive when others are suffering and when wrong is occurring to other people. Let's not just walk by and say, well, that's not our business. That's what Edom did. Look in verses 10 through 12. For violence against your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever in the day that you stood on the other side, in the day that strangers carried captive his forces, when foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. Now watch this. But you should not have gazed on in the day of your brother, in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of his distress. Well, what was Edom's fault? They were acting passive. In fact, they were, they were acting passive and rejoicing when others were hurting. That's not the way a Christian ought to do. That's not the way anybody want to do. I don't want it to be said of me, and you don't want it to be said of you, well, they didn't really do anything wrong, but they didn't do anything right either. They just kind of stood by and watched it happen. I didn't do anything. That excuse won't work. Yeah, Edom, I could have said, you know, I didn't do anything, but they didn't do anything to help either. Romans 1 verse 30 says, Not only those who do evil, but those who watch and take part in and rejoice in and support those who do evil are just as wrong as well. Don't rejoice or take advantage of other people and their destruction. Surely in times like these, that's the last thing a child of God ought to do. Verses 13 and 14, notice how Obadiah mentions that this is what the Edomites are doing. Verse 13 says, You should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of distress. Not only were they rejoicing, they're taking advantage of it. The gates of Jerusalem are open. 
What's their fault? Let's go in and get something. Let's take the spoils. Let's take advantage of them. Friend, in situations like these, the principle of reaping and sowing definitely will occur. For Obadiah verse 15 says this, For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. Watch this now. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal or repayment shall return upon your own head. How did God feel about this? They shouldn't have done that, God said. And because of these things, you're going to be repaid that way. Do you remember a New Testament passage that mentions principles like this? In Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, the Bible says, For whatever man sows, that will he also reap. He who sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He who sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap eternal life. What's the principle? You sow what you reap. You go out and plant corn, you're going to get a corn crop. You go out and plant thickets and briars and brambles, that's what's going to come up. You can't sow unrighteousness, ungodliness, jealousy, and rejoicing at the hand of your brethren's destruction and think that's going to be okay. Now, what's the application? In times when people are suffering, in times when destruction or devastation does occur, even if it may not be people who we agree with in their lifestyle, agree with in their morality, or agree with in other ways, I need to have compassion. I need to look for opportunities then to do good unto all men, especially the household of faith. I want to put a, a, a good word in. I want to be a good example for Christ. Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. In times like those, I want people to see Christ in us, the hope of glory, and that we're there trying to help and trying to do good in times like those. Now, what's going to happen to Edom? Well, the book of Obadiah tells us. Notice Obadiah, verses 16 through 20. The Scripture says, For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions, the house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame, but the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. The south shall possess the mountains of Esau. The lowland shall possess Philistia. They shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. Benjamin shall possess Gilead, and the captains of this host of the children of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. The captives of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the south. The Bible clearly teaches from this context Israel was going to have what was once Edom's. Did God rejoice in that? Of course not. Did He want Edom to be destroyed? Not at all. But remember, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Edom had been standing back rejoicing. They had been cheering on the enemies. They had been laughing at the downfall of, of their own brethren. And yet God says those brethren are going to inherit your land. Not one of you is going to be left. It's going to be total and utter calamity. What does God hate? God hates man's inhumanity to man. God hates it when we don't put that second of the greatest laws into effect. You remember the first law? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the second like unto it? Here it is. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Edom and Israel were neighbors. More than neighbors. They were brethren. And yet they didn't love them. They hated them. And as a result it led to their own downfall. Now, is there even in this book a glimpse of hope? Oh, you bet there is. Look at Obadiah verse 21. After Israel possesses the land, the Bible says, then saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau and the kingdom 
shall be the Lord. What is all this? Saviors to Mount Zion? Well, what is Mount Zion? It's Jerusalem. What are we talking about here? Here again, you've got prophetic glimpses of restoration. David? No. Who? Jesus. You shall call His name Jesus. He will save His people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Uh, the idea here is that there is going to be saviors. Yes, David might be an ultimate savior, but the real savior was going to be the Lord Jesus Christ. To save people from what? Sin, captivity, the stranglehold of death. Satan and his forces, ungodliness, immorality. Saviors are going to come to Mount Zion. Ultimately, Jesus Christ, when He there in Jerusalem uh, uh, came, and as He stood in Jerusalem and as He offered Himself as a sacrifice, as He was led out to Calvary and Golgotha, He made that great sacrifice. John said, as he saw Jesus approaching, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, and Peter later wrote, 1 Peter 2.24, Of that great Savior, who Himself bore our sins in His own body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Friend, let's do this. Let's look to ourselves and let's really see. Have we been dealing rightly with other people? H how do we treat those whom we may have a little grudge against? How do we treat those who are enemies? How do we treat even our own brethren and family? Now again, we may not agree with every moral issue. We may not agree with the sin they're living in. We may not agree with the ungodliness that their life represents, but I don't want them to die and go to hell. I don't want destruction to come. I want them to know Jesus and to be saved. For that's the only way that real change can occur. And so today's message is a message of hope through Christ again, the Savior of the world. We ask you today, have you obeyed the gospel? Have you become a Christian? Are you really living right with God? Peter said that we must repent and be baptized. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. If you've never done those things, friend, in view of that hope, won't you become a Christian today? You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.